I invite you to take your Bible and turn with me to the book of Ephesians. Paul's epistle to the Ephesians and chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6, and we want to begin with, I'm just going to read verse 2, then eventually we'll be looking at verses 1 through 4. But to start us off, Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 2, where Paul writes, Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise. Don't miss that parenthetical statement, which is the first commandment with promise. Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for blessing us. Thank you that we have this opportunity to be together. Thank you, especially for the mothers who are present here and those who cannot be with us. Lord, help us to do exactly what your word has said and to honor our father and our mother, in particular our mothers on this day. Lord, help us most of all to turn our attention towards you, to set aside those things which would distract, those things which would hinder us and cause us to be totally open to what you will say to us in this hour. Now forgive us anything that stands in the way of your blessing. And if anyone is listening today who doesn't know you as Savior, may they open their heart and trust Jesus this day. For the rest of us, Lord, let our hearts be drawn close to yours. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. On May 8, 1914, that's Approximately 110 years ago, just missed by President Woodrow Wilson issued a proclamation declaring Mother's Day as a national holiday. Since then, the second Sunday in May has been Mother's Day. And it's been that way for all of our lifetimes. And I hope that it'll be that way for a great number of years to come. So it's not only right and appropriate to honor our mothers, it's biblical. In the book of Exodus, chapter 20, we have the giving of what is commonly called the Ten Commandments. These form the basis of the law which God gave to Moses uh, on Mount Sinai in the wilderness. Moses gave to the uh, people of Israel, and the people of Israel gave it to the rest of the world. Used to be years ago that if you went into a courthouse or a school building or most other public buildings in our country in the United States, you would see the Ten Commandments portrayed either on a uh, written on a wall or in a frame on the wall or uh, carved into a monument somehow. You would see it there. You don't really see that uh, very much at all anymore, and that's sad uh, that we've gotten away from the basis of all the law that we have. But in Exodus chapter 20, verses 1 to 17, again, Uh, God gives the Ten Commandments. And verse 12 of that passage says, Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Now I want you to think about that. First verse that we're looking at here says, Children, obey your parents. But the second verse says, Honor thy father and thy mother, which is the first commandment with promise. So the first institution that God established in this world is that of the family. Before there was a government, before there was anything else, there was the family. And when we had the first family, we had the first home. It was God who designed the family. I I want you to listen to the scriptures. Genesis 1, chapter 27, 28 says, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. In the next chapter, Genesis chapter 2, verses 18 and verses 21 to 23, And the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make and help me for him, somebody fit for him. Chapter 3, verse 20, And Adam called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. So these are things that we see from the beginning of human life, from the beginning of people on this earth, that the home was established and honor was given to the mother. When it says 
he made a help meet for Adam. What that means is, gentlemen, that the woman was created to be a help meet. What does that mean, meet? Not that you meet up, and it has nothing to do with M-E-A-T. It's M-E-E-T, and it means fit. One's particularly fit. A preacher I knew years ago wrote, wrote a book called Woman the Completer. And what he was saying is men need women to complete them. I think it's interesting, sometime after that, his wife wrote a book. And in her books, she called her book Woman the Assembler. And, and she, said, she said men are, are all there, but they're in pieces. you got to put them together. <laughs> so I, I think it's interesting this husband and wife wrote these two books. But the truth of the matter is both of them were coming from the idea that marriage and as a result of marriage, the home and the family are God's plan, God's design, God's will from the beginning. And again, the very first institution on the earth. And it was God, again, who commanded, honor thy father and thy mother. Now, let's look at something else here. Verse 1 says, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Children ought to obey their parents. Now, we ought to obey our parents. Is there ever a time when it's okay to disobey the parents? Yes, there are times like that, but most of the time, most children aren't going to run into that situation. Well, when should you disobey your parent? If they ask you to do something that you know is inherently evil or something you know is absolutely wrong, then it's okay to disobey that and not do evil or wrong. But most of the time, your parents aren't going to ask you to do something inherently evil or wrong. So what should you do? Obey your parents. Well, what if I don't like what they said? That has nothing to do with it. What if I don't want to do it? That has even less to do with it, less than nothing. Children, obey your parents. Now, something else it says, in the Lord. Obey your parents in the Lord. Again, if you are following the Lord, and not everybody is, and we know that, but if you are following the Lord, you should obey your parents in the Lord. Why? For this is right. It's the right thing to do. And if we would learn that, if we learn respect at home, then we're going to learn respect out in the public. And we're going to learn to respect each other. I was at the grocery store yesterday, and there was a man behind me in the checkout line, and uh, I don't know his age. I, I've discovered I'm not very good at guessing people's ages. And I find out most people are older than that I think they are. So that should make you feel good. I'm looking at you and you probably look younger to me than you actually are. And uh, so that's great. But the fact of the matter is this, this man appeared to be my age or older. And he was just talking about his granddaughter. And boy, he's just going on and on and on about his granddaughter. And I thought that was great. I really did. He was telling me things she said and things she did and all that. Now, isn't that a wonderful? You know, the Bible says children are an heritage of the Lord. They're God's plan for going on in life, keeping the world going. And uh, they are a blessing. But children need to obey their parents in the Lord for this is right. And then verse 2 says, honor thy father and thy mother. And that includes obedience, but it's not limited to obedience. It goes beyond that. We honor our parents. The best way to honor our parents is to be the people whom we ought to be. I don't know if you've ever heard anybody say this. I've heard people say it to other people. When somebody does something that they should do anyway, when somebody does something good, something right, uh, I've heard people say, your parents must have taught you right. I don't know if you've ever heard that, but I have. And you know what? There's truth in that. There really is. There's truth in that. I remember as a young person, I was, I don't know, in, in my teens, uh, probably before I was 17 because I bought my first car when I was 17, but I was hitchhiking. You were what? I was hitchhiking. You did that? I used to do it a lot. Why? Because I needed to go places. Okay. <laughs> and uh, so I was hitchhiking and uh, this couple stopped, picked me up, gave me a ride, and I was riding in the back seat. And uh, I addressed the man as sir. And uh, the man said to me, you don't have to sir me, boy. And I said, yes, sir, I do. He said, Why? Because my mom and dad told me to say sir and ma'am. And, and uh, 
the lady that I knew and loved, she's passed on now and respect her very much. She thought it was insulting. She was not from the South. Let me emphasize that. And not that you have to be from the South, but she was not. So customs are different is my point. And she said, I don't like you calling me ma'am because that's that's disrespectful. I said, well, I, I'm sorry. I don't understand how it's disrespectful. I was taught it was very respectful and I don't mean to offend you. Well, I was taught to say yes, sir, and yes, ma'am. And the best way for us to honor our parents, not the only way, but the best way is for us to be the kind of people that we ought to be. And then we're a good reflection on them. You know, one of the best ways for you to honor the Lord is to be a good Christian, to be the person that you ought to be, to be a good testimony for the Lord, to be it, make it obvious that God made you a better person than you were before. Now, I think you need to put words with that, and, and I'll tell you why. Let's suppose you're out in public. Maybe you're working or, or you're in some other public setting, and uh, you're living a good Christian life. You're being a good person. You're doing things you ought to do, and you're doing things that are respectable, which you should do. But you never say a word about the Lord. I'm going to tell you what people are going to think. They're going to think what a good person you are. And that's okay as far as it goes, but it doesn't go far enough. They're going to think what a good person you are. What they need to know is who it is that makes you a good person. Now, speaking strictly for myself, if anybody thinks I'm a good person, I'm not saying everybody does, but if anybody thinks I'm a good person, it's not because of me. It isn't. Was your parents, you already said that. My parents did a great job. They were wonderful people. But it's because of the Lord. And the Lord changed my life, and I try to follow Him. And if I do anything good, it's because of Him. And folks need to know that. Now, in order to do that, we need to be Christians. So isn't everybody a Christian? Absolutely not. Uh, I did when I was a kid growing up. I thought being American and being Christian were equivalent. They are not. And and I mean no disrespect to our country. I consider myself a very patriotic individual, but that never was true. There never was a day when everybody who was American was a Christian. There was time in our history when the majority of people were Christians, but there was never a day when everybody in the country were Christians. There's a wonderful book out there. It's not in my notes. I wasn't going to mention this, but it just came to mind. It's, it's about that thick, and it was written in the early 1800s, published in the early 1800s. And the title of the book is The Lives of the Signers of the Declaration of Independence. The Lives of the Signers of the Declaration of Independence. And that book has a little two- or three-page biography of all of the 50-some men who signed the Declaration of Independence. If you read that book, you'll find all but two of them were professing Christians. And the two who did not profess to be Christians had great respect for all the others because they were Christians. Isn't that something? So when I say there was a time in America when the majority of people were Christians, that's historically true. Is that true today? Well, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. If you look at statistics, statistics are going to tell you that the majority of people in America still would list their religion as Christian. But well, that's become a very broad term. And it could mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. So let's analyze that for a moment. Being a Christian is not automatic. If your parents are Christian, and you're blessed if they are, if your parents are Christian and you are born their child, that does not automatically make you a Christian. If you're born in a Christian culture, that does not automatically make you a Christian. And it's not by any process of elimination. Well, I'm not, I'm not Buddhist and I'm not Hindu and I'm not Shinto and I'm not Muslim and I'm not. That doesn't make you a Christian. And it's not by doing the best we can. Well, you mentioned earlier the Ten Commandments. I certainly did. And I said they form the basis of our law and they do. But doing the best I can do and trying to obey the law and trying to be a good citizen for that matter does not make me a Christian. Well, what does? It comes by recognizing our need 
for forgiveness. Well, what do we need to be forgiven for? The things we've done wrong. Well, what are the things we've done wrong? Well, the Bible calls the things we've done wrong sin. And sin is violating the will of God, the things that God would have us to do, and the word of God. So that means that our ultimate authority is God. Now, we ought to obey our parents, and we ought to obey our government. We ought to obey the law, man's law. But who gave us the home and the family? Therefore, who gave us our parents? God. Who gave us the institution of government? God. He did? Yes, read your Bible. God gave us the human institution of government. So if God gave us the authority of the home, and he did, and he gave us the authority of government, and he did, doesn't that make God the ultimate authority? And yes, it does. Therefore, if God is the ultimate authority, he gets to tell us what is right and what is wrong, what is good and what is not good. So when I violate the will of God, when I violate those things which God would have me to do, that is sin. And when I violate the word of God, where he he expressly tells us what is good and what is bad, what is right and what is wrong, then that is sin. Now, there's all kinds of questions somebody could ask about that. And so one of them is, well, what if I don't know the will of God or I don't know the word of God? Uh, There is a theory in law and the theory is that ignorance is no excuse. Now, whether you like that theory or not, let, let me put it to you this way. There are certain things that you and I know, whether you've ever read a Bible or not, whether you this may be your first sermon you ever heard from a preacher, there are certain things that you know in your nature are right and are wrong. For example, you take a little child, and I love little children, and the song goes, Jesus loves little children, and he certainly does. But you take a little child who takes something they, they, they know they're not supposed to take. I heard somebody say this a while back. You probably heard the same thing. They said the land speed record was set by a toddler who was asked, what is that in your mouth? But you take a little child who's taking something they know they shouldn't take and you ask them about it. And first of all, they're going to show in their face that they know they've done something wrong. And many times, maybe not 100% of the time, many times they're going to lie to you about it. Now, who taught them to do that? Nobody. But they know it's wrong. They know it's wrong. Well, didn't you say parents teach us right and wrong? Of course. But that little one hasn't learned all those lessons yet. They're learning. They're learning. And a time like that's a great opportunity to teach. But we have a conscience who tells us what's right and what's wrong. So we know when we do wrong. We know that it's wrong to lie. We know that it's wrong to steal. We know that it's wrong to kill. We know these things are wrong. Whether we've ever read a Bible or not. I've noticed something, too, about human nature. If somebody is a thief and somebody steals something, let's let's say somebody stole $100. If somebody else steals that from them, they get angry about it. (laughs) Right? It wasn't yours to start with. You, You took it and somebody does to you what you did to somebody else and now you get angry about it. That's human nature. But you know... The reason they get angry is because they say that's wrong. Well, it was wrong when they did it. (laughs) They don't like it when it's done to them. So by nature, you know that it's wrong. So we recognize our need for forgiveness. And we need to realize that there's a penalty for sin. Now, there are different penalties for different human crimes. And uh, they may vary from state to state and county to county and city to city and certainly nation to nation. What is legal, perfectly legal in one place may not be in another place. And if you're going to travel, you need to learn that. Even traveling in this country, going from state to state, laws vary. But if we break the law, there's generally a penalty to be paid. That could be something small like a fine. I was quite some years ago when my My oldest son was going to university up in South Carolina. 
And I was driving up there one day and I drove through South Carolina. I haven't driven through South Carolina in quite a while, so I don't know if it's still this way or not. They had signs up all along the road, speeding, $250 fine and 30 days in jail. I said, $250 fine is, is expensive. 30 days in jail will ruin your life. <laughs> it, it really would. You could lose your job. You could lose your home. You could lose all kinds of things. That's that's pretty stiff penalty. Do they still do that? Again, I, I haven't been there in a long time. I don't know. But that was enough to tell me not to go speed in South Carolina. You know, didn't want to be doing that. Generally, there's a, a penalty if we commit a crime. It may be a small thing. It can be very serious. There is in this world, capital punishment. And again, depends on where you are, what country you're in. Some countries have outlawed capital punishment altogether. Uh, some countries who still have capital punishment, the United States, for example, still have it, but they've toned it down quite a bit to what it used to be. And then there are countries in which capital punishment is very much in practice and probably overused. Somebody said take probably out of that sentence and make it true. So we recognize our need for forgiveness because we've done something wrong and because there's a penalty for doing something wrong. What's wonderful is that we can know that the penalty has been paid. What if I was charged with a crime and, and let's make it a small crime, let's suppose a, a I was in South Carolina back in those days and I was speeding and, and, and I got stopped and uh, now I'm guilty and I owe $250 fine and possibly 30 days in jail. And what if they took me to the courthouse and uh, went before the judge and I think, boy, this is it. I'm in big trouble now. And the judge said, you're free to go. How am I free to go? Somebody already paid the penalty for you. Would that, would, would that be good news? Would be for me, that's for sure. Well, that didn't happen, but i tell you what did happen. I'm not proud of this, but I'm going to tell you the truth. The Bible says we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. Now, how many people does the Bible say have sinned? All. Does that make me a sinner? It sure does. It sure does. So if we've all sinned, and that means me, then I have violated God's will and I've violated God's law. And the Bible, the same book of the Bible, Romans says the wages of sin is death. The payday for sin is death. So now I'm, I'm under capital punishment. I'm under the death penalty. But you know what? Somebody paid the penalty for me. They did. That's what that, that's about up there, the cross. The cross is all about the fact that the penalty was paid for me. I got great news. It was paid for you too. John writes in 1 John says he is the propitiation. He, Jesus Christ, is the propitiation, payment in full for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Whose sins did Jesus pay for at the cross? Everybody's. Whose sins did Jesus pay for at the cross? Mine. Whose sins did Jesus pay for at the cross? Yours. The penalty has already been paid. And I understand that by trusting in Jesus Christ who paid the penalty, he'll forgive me. He'll grant me forgiveness. And as he grants me forgiveness, he grants me everlasting life. Now, I told you all of that to tell you that being a Christian is the best way we can bring honor to God. And it's the best way we can honor our parents by living the Christian life. But to live the Christian life, you have to begin by being a Christian. You are not a Christian until you have trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior. You might be a member of a church. You might have gone through some religious ritual such as baptism or catechism or something else. But that does not make you a Christian. You are not a Christian until you have trusted Jesus Christ to save your soul. Once you've done that, you have been, Jesus' term, born again. And you're born again, just like a newborn babe. Apostle Peter writes, as, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word, the word of God, that you may grow thereby. 
And so you begin growing. So what are you? You're a children, a child of God by faith in Jesus Christ. And you want to grow. What's the ultimate goal? To grow up to be like him, Ephesians chapter 4. So that is how you can best honor your mother. Be a Christian and live a Christian life. Live a life according to the will of God and the word of God and you will honor your mother. You will. If you are like some people and you say, well, I don't care about any of that. I'm just going to go my own way, do my own thing. And nobody on earth or in heaven is going to tell me what I can and can't do. I'm just going to do what I want. Then you are not going to honor your mother. I'll give you an illustration of that before we're finished. But it also says in verse 2, it says, Honor thy father and thy mother, which is the first commandment with promise. Now, what is the promise? Well, God says, if you do this, I will do certain things also. There's a promise. If you honor your father and your mother, there's a promise connected to it. The promise is this, and this comes from Exodus chapter 20. And thou mayest live long upon the earth. That's the promise. One of the chief blessings of honoring your father and your mother is this, that you will live longer. Longer than what? Well, it's real simple. Longer than you'll live if you don't honor your father and mother. It's, it's real simple. You see, the Bible says it's appointed unto man once to die, but after this the judgment. We all have an appointment with death. But apparently there are ways to get an extension. And one of the ways that is promised to us is if you honor your mother. Well, how much longer do I get? I'm not sure. Doesn't say. I don't make that decision. That's up to God. But it's longer than you'll live if you don't honor your parents. Well, I know somebody honored their parents and, and, and they died young. I wouldn't argue that with you. I'm sure that's true. Well, what do you do with that? I don't do anything with it. God knows. God knows what's right. So this is the first commandment with promise. It's not a good suggestion. It's not a strong rec recommendation. It's a commandment. And if we don't obey the commandment, then we have committed a sin against God and we have directly disobeyed God and we do not get to claim that promise. Now, I want to talk about something else here. Let's read verse 4. And you fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. We're going, to, we're going to talk about how parents influence their children. Well, let's stay with mothers. This is Mother's Day. All mothers should be honored. Why? God said so. He said, honor your mother. All mothers should be honored. Are all mothers honorable? Well, again, Eve was the mother of all living. Was she perfect? No. None of us are but she was the mother of all living, should be honored. Hannah was an honorable mother who gave her son to the Lord and her son Samuel became a great man of God. King Lemuel, who we'll talk about tonight if you'll come back at six o'clock, King Lemuel wrote of her, um, sorry, King Lemuel wrote of his mother and called her a virtuous woman whose price is far above rubies. What is he saying? He was saying that she was a woman of courage and strength and honor and virtue. He speaks very highly of his mother. Come tonight, we'll show you how he praised his mother. Mary, no doubt, was the ideal mother. But are all honorables, are, I'm sorry, are all mothers honorable? Second Corinthians chapter 22, 3 says this. I want you to listen carefully. It's talking about a guy named Ahaziah. Ahaziah was king of Judah. And here's what it says. His, Ahaziah, King Ahaziah's, his mother was his counselor to do wickedly. Can you imagine that? His mother was his counselor to do wickedly. That's not very honorable. But you know what God didn't say? He didn't say honor your mother unless she's your counselor to do wickedly. He didn't say that. He said honor your mother. Honor your mother. So every mother should be honored because God tells us so. 
And God's word tells us precisely that it is the right thing to do because every mother has carried a child or children and has had that child or children born to them. Every mother has put her own life at risk for that child or those children. Every mother cares for her children. Some no doubt care more than others, but every mother cares. So the commandment is not honor your mother if she gives you everything you want. The commandment is not honor your mother if she lets you do anything you want and everything you want. The commandment is not honor your mother if she never asked you to do anything at all. The commandment is not honor your mother if she lives up to your every expectation. If you knew my mother, she doesn't do... That's not what it says, is it? It says honor your mother. The commandment is to honor your mother. No ifs, no ands, no buts, no conditional requirements. Just honor your mother. I said I'd give you an illustration uh, of honoring your mother, but it's not not make you a wonderful person. It's the right thing to do. You're supposed to. You're supposed to obey your mother. You're supposed to honor your mother. But could somebody honor their mother and still not be the right kind of person themselves? Yes. Let me give you an illustration. Years ago, we held, um, and we did this for many years, we held uh, services at a retirement home up in Boynton Beach. And uh, in that particular one, particular facility, they had a library. And that's where we met much of the time was in the library. And I noticed a book on the shelf in the library, and the title caught my attention. A lot of times, titles of books catch my attention. I run a couple by you that, that have caught my attention. There was a book, the title was, All You Can Do Is All You Can Do. Subtitle was, But All You Can Do Is Enough. You know what, folks? I never read that book. But I got a lot out of that title. I really did. All you can do is all you, if you've done all you can do, then that really is all you can do, isn't it? There's another book. I had this one. The title of it was real simple. I was wrong. That's real simple, isn't it? I was wrong. Now, whether you read that book or not, you can get a lot out of that title. Just say, I was wrong. Well, the title of this book that I saw in the library there was, But He Was Good to His Mother. That sounds good, doesn't it? But he was good to his mother. It was written by a man named um, named Rockaway, Robert Rockaway. And that title intrigued me, and I commented on a, a few times, like I am right now. And Brother Ryan Price, who's pastor at Fort Lauderdale Baptist Church down in Fort Lauderdale, he knew that I had an interest in it, so he bought a copy of it and gave it to me. And I read it. And I learned how Mr. Rockaway came to that title, but he was good to his mother. The book is all about gangsters and organized crime. That's what the book is about. No kidding. That's what the book is all about. And it's not a novel or anything. It's, it's, it's history. It's all about gangsters and organized crime. Mr. Rockaway, the author of the book, states in that book how he was telling his mother about a man that they both knew who was a notorious gangster, a known criminal, wanted by the law, had a, actions that had resulted in the deaths of people, had committed numerous crimes, known gangster. Mr. Rockway said he was telling his mother about that man that they both knew, and he was telling her that he was not a good man. And he was telling her the fact that this man was this notorious criminal and guilty of horrific deeds. Mr. Rockaway recorded that when he told his mother all about this man, his mother said to him, but he was good to his mother. You know what? He probably was. He probably was good to his mother. Doesn't erase all the evil he did. Doesn't erase all the crimes he committed. He was good to his mother. Say, well, doesn't that count for something? It does. It's not going to buy him one second in heaven, but it counts for something. It's a good thing, but it's not good enough. 
You know what that man needed that he was talking about? He needed, just like I told you about a while ago, he needed to be forgiven of his sins. He needed to realize that he, like all the rest of us, was a sinner. He needed to come to Christ and confess his sins and trust Jesus to forgive his sins, knowing that they're paid for at the cross. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32 says this, and listen to the whole verse. Be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another. Now, that, I hope that sounds good to you so far because it should. We should be kind to each other. And we should be tender-hearted and forgiving each other. But that's not the end of the verse. It says, be ye kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. Here's what that verse means. When I come before God and I confess my sins to him, he doesn't look at me and make any excuses for me. He doesn't say, well, you know, you're... Yeah, you did some wrong here, but look at all the good you've done. He doesn't, doesn't say that. Evangelist Fred Brown, one of the four best preachers I ever heard in my life, he said this. He said, one sin has enough power to condemn your soul for all eternity. That's a sobering thought. How could he say something like that? All right, let me put it this way. How many times do you need to steal to be a thief? One, how many times do you need to lie to be a liar? One, how many times do you need to kill to be a murderer? How many times do you need to sin to be a sinner? The wages of sin is death. That's what Fred Brown was saying. And so this man needed to know that his sins were paid for at the cross, just like I need to know that. And I come to Jesus and I say, Lord, forgive my sins. I'm guilty. I have no excuse. And he doesn't make any excuses for me. He doesn't say, I'll let you slide. He doesn't say, you'll do better next time. He, none of that. You know what he says? Paid for at the cross. Paid for at the cross. Paid in full at the cross. Even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. I want to read something here. I've read it here before. I think I read it last Mother's Day here. I, I have a hard time reading it, but I'm going to close with it. And I hope, uh, honestly, that I can get through it because I have a hard time reading it. Um, it's not mine. I want to make that very clear. I, I heard it years ago, read it years ago, and I've used it many times since then. But it says this. A baby asked God, the Heavenly Father, they tell me that you are sending me to earth tomorrow, but how am I going to live there being so small and helpless? God said your angel will be waiting for you and will take care of you. The child further inquired, but tell me, here in heaven I don't have to do anything but sing and smile and be happy. God said your angel will sing for you and will also smile for you. In addition, you will feel your angel's genuine love and warmth, and you will be very happy. Again, the child asked, and how am I going to be able to understand when people talk to me if I don't know the language? God said your angel will tell you the most beautiful and sweet words, sweetest words you will ever hear, and with much patience and care. Your angel will lovingly teach you how to speak. And what am I going to do when I wish to talk to you? God said your angel will teach you how to talk to me. And who is going to protect me? God said your angel will defend you at all costs, even if it means risking its life. But I will always be sad, the baby said, because... I will not see you anymore. God said, your angel will always talk to you about me and will teach you the way to come back to me, even though I will always be near you. At that moment, there was much peace in heaven. The voices from earth could, not, could, could be heard. And the child hurriedly asked, 
God, if I am to leave you, please tell me my angel's name. God said, you would just call her mom. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, thank you so much that we can come to you and call you our Heavenly Father. And we thank you for our fathers on earth. But Lord, today, we thank you for our mothers. And Lord, one of the highest callings of any person on earth is that of the calling of mother. Lord, if we are to honor our mothers as you have commanded us to do, we need to be honorable people. And to be honorable people, as we've already heard, we need to come to you and confess our sins, that you might forgive our sins, trusting that Jesus paid for our sins on the cross, was buried and rose again, is alive today and ready and willing to forgive us, to save us, and to give us everlasting life. Thank you, Lord. Thank you so much. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. I'm going to finish this prayer in just a second. Before I do, let me tell you what we're going to do next. We're, when I say amen to the prayer, I'm going to leave the platform. I'm going to stand down front. We're going to sing a hymn. We call it the hymn of invitation. We are inviting you. If you are not 100% sure that when you close your eyes the final time, when you breathe your last breath, that you are going to be in heaven with your sins forgiven, and you're going to be the heir of eternal life, I want you to come. We'll have somebody sit with you and take a Bible and show you what it means to be saved. If you say, well, preacher, I already did that, then you don't need to do it again. But if there's a question or a doubt in your mind, or perhaps something else, you don't have a question or a doubt in that area, but you've got something that God's been speaking to you about, and there's a spiritual need in your life, you come. Maybe a decision you need to make, a spiritual decision. You come. We'll pray with you. We'll counsel you. If need be, we'll make an appointment to talk further later. But that's what we're here for. We're here to help. So you are invited to come. When we sing the hymn in just a moment, God speaking to you, just leave your place and come on down front. Father, bless and move this invitation time, we pray. Lord, it may be that there are people here who haven't trusted you as Savior. I pray for their eternal souls that they would trust you and they would do so now. Lord, I pray for those who do know you, to whom you may be speaking, who need to make a fresh commitment to you or have a major decision they need to make, or you're speaking to them about something that I've not even mentioned, but you have been dealing with their heart. And they need to come and they need prayer. We pray that you'd bring them. And Lord, help all of us to honor our mother. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.